Uh, all right. Hi, everyone. Um, it's great to be here in Lisbon with all of you. Um, thank you for OWASP uh, for having us. Um, yeah, so here's a quick intro to myself. I've spent the last 10 years working in security, doing all of the things from detection and response to infrasec to <coughs> cloud security. Um, at the moment, I'm a security engineering manager at SEMGREP, and I'm also an advisor at Panther. And I'm a part of uh, several security community groups, including ones that are focused on supporting women in security. <coughs> Um, I used to be a DNR manager at Sentry, and then before that, a senior security engineer at Cloudflare, um, where I was focused on securing the production network that Cloudflare runs on. I'm Leif. I'm a senior engineering manager here at SEMGRIP. Uh, I've worked in information security in a variety of different roles for a little bit over a decade. I also co-host a podcast, uh, 404 Security Not Found. We do monthly news and discussion topics, so... If that's something you're interested in, uh, check us out. I also do a little bit of startup investing and advising. And before this, I was on the security team at Twilio segment, um, Twilio bot segment, but I was there before and after the acquisition doing a combination of application security and software engineering. Um, what's SEMGREP? Uh, you might have heard of our open source tool, but we also have offerings for static analysis, software composition analysis, and secret scanning. So if you want to learn more about that, we have a booth. Uh, I'll be there later, so please swing by and uh, ask me questions about this or, or anything else. So our agenda for today, we're going to talk a little bit about how performance reviews work, how to prepare for them going uh, throughout the year, how to get recognized for your work, how to have ladder-based career conversations, and how to prepare for promotions. At the end of this presentation, you should hopefully have some new tools to help you get that next raise or promotion. And our, <clears throat> our slides are on sketch, so if there's anything that you want to go back and reference later, just go to the schedule and there's a PDF at the bottom that you can download. Um, that saves you from having to take a bunch of pictures. Um, show of hands, who here is currently an individual contributor? Cool. Um, how many of you would con uh, consider yourselves as early in your career? Uh, how many of you are interested in becoming a manager someday? And how many of you are managers right now? Cool. All right. Um, so this talk is for both managers and individual contributors. Misha and I are both first-line managers, meaning that we manage individual contributors and have obviously been individual co contributors at some point in our career. Um, if you're an individual contributor, you should get insight into how a layer above you and your organization operates. And uh, managers, these are areas that you can coach your team. So a lot of this is kind of directed towards individual contributors, but if you're a manager, you should be able to apply these to the folks that uh, report to you. And uh, you also need to apply these to yourself if you're a manager because you're also trying to grow in your career. And if you're a good manager, uh, growing within your company is going to help the people that report to you because you're going to have more scope and influence. Our philosophy is that it doesn't matter if you're an individual contributor or a manager, you're responsible for much of your own career development. Part of your manager's job is to teach you these skills to help you stay on track and to help you collaboratively chart a course but they shouldn't be expected to plan your career for you. Things are pretty formulaic early in your career when you're going from uh, like entry-level engineer to mid-level engineer, but they get much less so the farther you move up. And because you're going to be working more autonomously and because you're going to have your own unique challenges, uh, you need to be able to figure a lot of this stuff out uh, on your own. Learning to do these things independently is going to help insulate you from bad managers, instances where your manager changes, changes to the organization as a whole, and it's going to help you accelerate your growth. Nobody else is going to be with you your whole career, so mastering these things is going to have a very large impact. All right, so I'm going to be talking about what to prepare for um, throughout the year. 
So, you know, throughout the year, everyone is juggling a lot and it's easy for things to slip through the cracks or for us to remember exactly what happened even a couple months ago. Um, your manager is bound to miss things and especially if you're on a big team. So when you're thinking, when you're early on in your career, uh, managers tend to do a bit more handholding. And so you might think that they're going to be around to keep doing that, but the reality is they won't. So make sure you understand how performance reviews work and how calibrations uh, work at your company. And if your manager doesn't know, uh, then make sure they do and hold them accountable for that. So one of the reviews that you'll need to prepare for are full performance reviews. So these full performance reviews are usually twice a year, sometimes once. Um, and during these reviews, you'll have to do self reviews. Uh, which are a great opportunity to have a permanent record of everything that you've done. And you'll also have to do peer reviews where people you collaborate with um, the most will have an opportunity to leave a review for you. Um, these are usually around three to five, and we will talk about um, how to prepare for these later on. And then finally, you have downward manager reviews. These usually include a rating like meets expectations or exceeds or <clears throat> doesn't meet an, uh, our... Um, yeah, and then there's also a promotion readiness rating. So you want to prepare for these by taking notes year-round, not by trying to recall what happened months ago when you're told that it's time to prepare for reviews. So it's something else that you'll have to prepare for are promotions-only uh, reviews. So some places only do promotions-only reviews once a year, usually, and this is when only promotion-ready employees are reviewed and put up for promotion. Um, it's usually a bit more lightweight and... Uh, by definition, focused entirely on promotions. Uh, so once it's time for calibrations, managers should have everything ready to go. This is what we're referring to when we say promotion pack packets. Um, they, they include artifacts, reviews, and other testimonials that, you know, we'll all need to kind of paint the picture that you're ready to get promoted. Uh, this is going to be reviewed by engineering management or leadership, and there might be questions on whether this person is actually ready to be promoted. So understanding this process is uh, impactful to your career and compensation. Once everything's ready to go, managers meet for calibration. Calibration is just when managers go over projects, ratings, and promotion readiness for their reports. Um, managers can expect for their proposals to be stress tested. And when you, um, and so other managers will ask questions and, you know, challenge the ratings that you've given your direct reports. And this is when ratings can change or promotions can get rejected. So this is the moment you and your manager need to prepare for uh, together and make sure you understand the process really well, because it's incredibly impactful to your own career as a manager and to your direct reports. Um, and during this you know, conversation or calib calibration, having disagreement or questions is a good thing because you want it to be a fair process. Um, so a curveball you might face as an IC, uh, manager ch changes. They happen. Uh, they can be challenging, and especially in terms of making sure that you maintain momentum towards a promotion. So your new manager is going to be less familiar with your work. Uh, you need to give them context as an IC with all the different artifacts that Leaf is going to go over soon. <clears throat> You might be tempted to think that your old manager is going to take care of this for you, and uh, but you really need to take responsibility for, for yourself and your own career, so be proactive during this transition. Um, ideally, you would have written down all your accomplishments, and it's as simple as like sharing something with them and then adding in some color and context to it. So manager changes. Uh, so if you're a manager, um, this is your chance to make sure that promotions for your directs uh, go through and don't get dropped just because of a manager change. Um, your past reviews are going to be really helpful here to get it, to get the new manager up to speed. I also found that past peer reviews are really helpful to give a more comprehensive look at the person. Um, and we all know, you know, the managers can make or break your experience. So if a direct report doesn't get their promotion through, uh, it could be tied to um, attrition, you know, and people leaving. Um, yeah. And there are also unpredictable changes like reorgs. You may switch teams or the impact that you've had on your old team may be lost if you don't record it. So it's really powerful at any point in time to be able to just point to everything that you've done and be able to talk about it. And 
Yeah. The truth is you're responsible for your own career. So the earlier you learn how to manage yourself, I think that's a talent in and of itself, um, the better off you'll be. And as you get more senior at life, like Leaf said, advancing in your career is less straightforward. So learning how to navigate through these types of events will insulate you from bad managers or unfavorable reorgs or anything that's really out of your control. Um, so now Leaf is going to go over some ways to do that. Planning docs and retrospectives can help keep projects on track and reduce instances where you make repeated mistakes. These docs are common in security and engineering organizations, but they can also be really helpful uh, for your career growth since they're a written record of your major projects. How many of you folks write down a plan and have people look it over before you start a big piece of new work? Cool, a few people. Um, I highly recommend doing this. Writing down a plan for your work is just a really good way to practice your writing, which gets more important the more senior you get. Um, it's really important to be able to influence people at your company. And now that people are working across the globe asynchronously, I think writing has become even more important than it has been in the past. And this is also an opportunity to socialize your plan with people and get them bought in before you actually start the work. It's a lot better to have people tell you about potential problems now than when you've already done something and that then you have to undo your work and redo it. And it's actually good, I think, at this phase to get some amount of conflict in your design docs. It's Your design is going to be better if people actually tell you the problems that they think are present. And then that allows you to address them and come up with a better plan together. Just remember that if you're reviewing somebody else's docs, you're debating the idea, not the person. Uh, it isn't about being right. It's about helping you or whoever you're working with come up with the best design. As part of writing a, a engineering plan, I recommend writing down different milestones and estimating the time required to do different pieces of the work. Um, this is really helpful if you need to end a project early because sometimes the work is still in a usable state because you've reached a certain milestone. It's also good to be explicit about the things you're not doing. We all have a lot of uh, different priorities. We don't always have time to do everything associated with a project in one go. And it's good to be explicit about the things you're not going to do so that people that review your plan understand that you're not doing this work and why. I also really encourage people to add uh, instances of how you're going to test this work, how you're going to support this project long term, and which metrics you want to establish to determine if this work is successful. I also in recommend including these as milestones in your project planning because you almost always have to do the metrics work at the end. And if you don't do the metrics work, a lot of times you're just losing out on all these metrics. And if you need to make changes in the future, it's a lot uh, more time consuming because you have to go add in the instrumentation, wait to collect data, and then make a decision. It's a lot better if you can just be always collecting this information. Uh, one, uh, this allows you to know whether your work was worth doing. And two, even if your work is something that's going to be going on for a long time, this is a really good way to make sure that you can continue supporting this project or kill the project if it's not useful, because you'll be able to know if people are actually using it or not. Um, I know a lot of people struggle to do maintenance on older stuff. And if you can show, hey, this is something that 50% of our customers are using or 25% of people internally are using at least once a month, it can be a lot easier to rationalize spending time on this type of thing rather than if you're just like, oh, I just I think people are using this, but I don't really know how many. Uh, I wrote a blog about this uh, a couple of years ago um, at, at my previous company. So if you want to learn more about my opinions on metrics and uh, what things to track, uh, can can check that out. Um, so engineering design docs are good at the beginning of a project. Project retrospectives or retros are useful at the end of a project. Um, similarly to the last slide, how many of you do project retros when you reflect on a project after it's been finished? Cool. If you don't, this is the template that I use. It's pretty simple. I don't like to make this a painful part of the process. Um, an intro is just something that people can easily get some context about what your project is. Write this in a way that your manager or your manager's manager could understand. Uh, assume that they're already at least somewhat familiar. And then include links. So if you have links to your original design doc, to metrics dashboards, or uh, if you caused any incidents during the development of this, make sure that you include those documents as well. 
Um, these things are just helpful if somebody needs to go back and understand the context of the retro. Um, which parts of this went well? Which parts didn't go well? What are things that you want to replicate next time or avoid next time? These are all good things to write down. And once you've completed this document, I recommend sharing it with your team so that other people on your team can learn and avoid the same mistakes or replicate the things that made you successful. These are also a great source of material during performance reviews. I think a lot of companies have a question that asks about areas of improvement. This question is something that a lot of people dread, but if you've already written this stuff down and published it within your company, uh, it makes this question a lot easier um, when you get asked this during performance reviews. We also do quarterly team retros that aren't tied to a specific project. It's more holistic about what we did over the course of the, the whole quarter. We used FigJam, which is part of Figma, um, and it's a really good experience because it's great for synchronous remote work. I ask people to populate the what happened section um, before the meeting. Um, this section is generally like not a lot of discussion. It's mostly just a record of what we did. Um, and then we uh, collaboratively fill out the what went well and um, uh, what problems did we face sections. And we'll start grouping things together that are similar. We'll add stickers to indicate like, hey, I agree with this thing or, or I'm confused by this thing. And then we'll spend time talking about those. And as we talk through the green and the purple sections, um, we'll uh, add learnings and potentially action items. And then at the end of the meeting, we'll uh, assign things that we actually want to execute on. I also highly recommend taking weekly notes. I have a recurring calendar event on Fridays to uh, write down notes. I know this is just one more thing that you have to do, but I found these to be really helpful in a lot of different situations. They're helpful when you need to write a, your self review. They're helpful if you need to write a downwards review as a manager. They're also really helpful uh, when writing peer reviews. Writing peer reviews is a really important part of getting folks that you work with recognized and promoted. And so having information that helps them do that is a really great thing to do for people. And then I've also found them really helpful when I'm having ongoing conversations with people, either on my team or somebody that I work with closely. It's great to be able to refer back to notes and be like, OK, how long have we been talking about this? What did we talk about last time? Um, which progress uh, am I seeing from this person? Um, and so I, it's a really good thing, especially if you're a manager. But I encourage people, even if you're not a manager, to do this. It's also a good reminder to send notes to people's managers that you work with that are doing good work. I, I don't think enough people do this, but it actually makes a really big impact to just send people's uh, managers notes to be like, hey, this person was a great person to work with on this project, and, and here's why. All of these documents and other documents are helpful for writing reviews for yourself and others. They also create a written record of what happened, keep people informed of your work, and allow people to learn from your experiences. I take all these documents, and I encourage people on my team to take all these documents and create a hype list. A hype list tracks your accomplishments. This could be uh, a project you worked on, somebody that you mentored. It could be giving a conference presentation uh, or anything else that you think is significant. Uh, I know I already told you, hey, you should be taking weekly notes. This is another thing that uh, you probably don't want to do, but it, I do think it is worth doing on a regular basis. Uh, you might be thinking, I'm, I'm busy, I don't want to do this, my manager already knows what I'm working on. But I think if you spend a little bit of time a couple times a month, uh, the commitment should be pretty low. And uh, if you spend time on this, uh, you'll have a good record of all of the things that you did in one place, as well as metrics associated with uh, like how well they went. And I tell the people on my team, if it's not on your hype list, it didn't happen, which is a little bit hyperbolic, but it really is a good way to think about this when you think about the importance of having this record. At some point, you're going to need this information. You're going to look for a new job. You're going to want to update your LinkedIn. You're going to want to update your resume. Or maybe you're happy at your current job and you're just writing a self-review. Having all this stuff written down and... Uh, like in one easy to use place makes all of those things, which can be pretty challenging, a lot easier. It's also great for onboarding your new manager, as Misha mentioned earlier. If you're now reporting to a new person, you can just share your hype list with them and they should be able to uh, fairly quickly get up to speed about what you've been up to the last six or 12 months. 
Even if you're reporting to the same person, it's still helpful. Uh, they always have multiple people reporting to them, and they're not going to know everything that you're working on, especially as you get more autonomous and you just are able to do projects on your own. Like, there's people on my team that are relatively senior, and I kind of just tell them, like, hey, we, we need this, and they just do all the steps, and then it's just done at the end, and I, I don't really track what they're doing throughout the project. So having something like this is really, really helpful. So uh, hopefully I've sold you on making one of these. Uh, this is a really simple format that I use. I just use a spreadsheet in Google Docs. Um, I have the month that this happened. I have what it is. This is just a quick summary of what you did, uh, no more than a sentence. Assume the person that's reading it knows what you're, you've been working on for the most part. Um, the impact section, this is the, the third column. I think this is the most important column, especially for people that are earlier in their career and aren't always thinking about why this work matters. Uh, how is it helping your customers? How is it helping your teammates? How is it helping your company? I think a lot of people, especially earlier in their career, just think about like, hey, I did this work that was assigned to me and less about uh, like why and, and how it has made our organization better. Um, <clears throat> and then any other notes, so this could be links to the original engineering documents, any of the metrics dashboards, that kind of thing. Um, this is really helpful because you can say, hey, I, I built this and 10% of our customers are using it, or I built this and we're able to decrease this painful process by 15% or something. That's a lot more impactful um, when you're talking in calibration and performance reviews than just saying, like, hey, I built this thing. Does... Anybody have a doc like this already? Few people? Cool. Yeah, if you don't have this, I really recommend starting this next week. Um, focus on the last six months. You don't need to do your whole career. And you can go back and look at pull requests, project documents, uh, your calendar to backfill data. If that sounds horrible, just start with your most recent project and do it going forward. Um, now I'm going to talk about a few ways to get recognized for your work. This isn't about bragging, um, but an important component of getting rewarded for your hard work is people knowing that you've done it in the first place. Um, <laughs> this helps people at your company stay informed about what people are working on. Um, and as I've mentioned earlier, the more senior you get, the more important technical communications are because you're expected to be able to influence more people throughout your company. And it's just important for people to know what your areas of expertise are. Uh, this can lead to interesting project opportunities where you can collaborate across teams. Um, it could give you the chance to mentor others. And it also is helpful during calibrations. As Misha mentioned earlier, calibrations are when a lot of managers get together and talk about people on their collective teams. And having people familiar with your work already makes that a lot easier. It also is going to help people uh, write good peer reviews for you, which are used as part of the, the performance review process. Here's a few ways that you can share your work. Uh, at SEMGREP, we do weekly demos uh, internally, so you can just sign up. Anybody can demo. It doesn't have to be engineering. It doesn't have to be security. We have people in finance that demo stuff. We have people on our recruiting team that demo stuff. Um, we also have a product updates channel. This one is more engineering-centric since it's things that actually affect our customers, generally speaking. Um, but we also have public team channels where people can post smaller updates um, so that other people that are interested in what that team is working on uh, can see what they're up to. We also have a shout-outs channel where you can recognize people that have been helpful to you. Um, and this is also a way to just mention projects as well. Um, if your project is something that's uh, larger or more complex or something that customers will use or maybe another team will use, writing down good documents and potentially giving trainings is helpful. This is a good way to allow them to self-service. It allows you to answer fewer questions because people hopefully know how things are working on their own. Um, and then you can also write blogs and speak at events. Uh, I know it can be really uncomfortable talking about your accomplishments, but you need to get comfortable doing it. And it does get easier over time. Uh, you might be thinking, hey, shouldn't my manager be talking about my accomplishments and like giving me shout outs and things like that? Uh, the answer is, of course, yes, your manager should be doing this, but it's more effective if you're both doing it. Um, there also might be a time in your career where you don't have a manager or this person just isn't really doing this kind of thing. And so having this muscle built independently allows you to still do well during those times. This could be a whole separate talk, but if you are interested in, in blogging or speaking, I highly recommend starting with an outline. 
Your outline serves as the basis for your blog. Uh, it also serves as the basis for your CFP for a presentation like this. Um, an outline can be built over the course of months. Just write stuff down every time it comes up in your mind so you don't forget it. Don't worry too much about organizing it. You can do that later. Um, I actually wrote notes about this presentation for about six months before I actually took the time to like submit to a conference. Um, and so it doesn't need to be something that happens overnight. Um, this also really helps with recruiting. If you're a company that can talk about their work, you're going to attract people that want to work on those same kind of things. If you've never worked, or sorry, if you've never spoken on a podcast or at a local meetup group, um, most podcasts and meetup groups are always looking for speakers. Uh, as somebody who used to be a, a meetup group organizer, we were always in need of people to speak. And a lot of times it's just whoever the organizers are, like asking their friends and things like that because they just need more speakers. And when you're submitting, make your title uh, attention grabbing, but informative. People need to know what they might be getting themselves into when they, they look at the schedule. And everybody gets rejected. Uh, this talk got rejected from another conference, so just keep submitting to places. It happens to even the most popular speakers, even if they don't tweet about when they get rejected, they just tweet about when uh, they get accepted. So uh, just keep trying. And then if you do get accepted somewhere, don't forget to add these activities to your hype list. I think there's actually a lot of parallels between using an outline to give a talk, using an outline to write a blog, as using a hype list to update your resume, update your LinkedIn, um, or use it as part of a performance review because you're taking this like raw document and using it in more um, impactful ways. I wrote a couple of blogs last year about this topic. So if you want to read more about the mechanics of writing blogs, becoming a guest on podcasts, or helping folks at your team do these things, um, I get asked a lot about, you know, doing this kind of work and did my best to write down everything I know <laughs> so that I don't forget it when people ask me about it. And then I also gave a conference talk uh, with the former CISO of Segment and Twilio, uh, Colleen Coolidge, who's really good at this stuff as well. And um, we have a presentation that's recorded. So uh, hopefully I've inspired you a little bit. This could be you next year. I love hearing about people submitting to their first conference. So uh, shoot me a message on LinkedIn or, or Twitter if you end up um, taking that step. And I will hand it back over to Misha to talk about having ladder-based career conversations. Uh, in case it isn't obvious yet, uh, being able to take good notes is pretty important as a manager. So I'm going to tell you uh, more ways that you should be taking notes. Um, so using your ladders. Uh, ladders are admittedly an imperfect system, but they do help standardize levels. Um, and without them, it's more likely that the process is going to be influenced by subjective views. So They'll help you with tying your work to a more widely accepted standard in the industry um, and uh, line it up to like what it means to be at a certain level. So first, what are ladders and why do we have them? Um, again, they're, an, they're a great way to set expectations for what people need to be doing at their role and to be considered uh, meeting their expectations, right? So it's an objective way to get people aligned on promotion readiness for someone. Um, and if you're just starting out in your career uh, and you're not sure what ladders are, there are some public resources out there. Um, Progression.fyi is one, but if you just search up like engineering career ladder or uh, security engineer ladders, um, there are companies out there that have published their ladders publicly. Um, and if your company doesn't have ladders, uh, I think this could be a good opportunity for you to bring them in. If you're a manager, then you're really in a great position to propose that, maybe put together a peer group and start building them. And if you're an IC, I would strongly recommend uh, speaking with your manager and you know getting buy-in to, to build career ladders. So uh, career convos. Um, so these are convos that you want to have regularly. And it can be as simple as, you know, as a manager asking your IC, like, what do you want to be doing in the next year? Like, what are your goals? Um, and getting them prepared uh, to, to identify, like, how to get to the next level. And you want to be on the same page about ratings and promotion readiness. Um, ideally, you've been doing this regularly. I um, mean, if you haven't, I would start doing them soon. Um, and I would say once a quarter is 
pretty like it's a good cadence. Um, and for early career engineers, doing it more often can actually help keep them on track. They are usually expected to get promoted more quickly. Um, and I would coordinate when you're having these conversations with performance reviews. So you don't want to leave it to the last minute, you know, like a week or two before you want to give yourself enough time to make sure you're prepared and uh, on the same page. So in terms of how to form a deconstructed career ladder, you want to start by taking your company career ladders and mapping each section to a heading. So what we've done is uh, where you see like impact and craft, like those are sections, and then each of the lines underneath are bullet points that SamGrep has at our you know at our company for engineering for engineers. Um, and so each bullet point can have its own line, and some bullet points can be combined if it gets to be too long. Um, and we recommend sharing this document, just a spreadsheet in Google Google Docs, basically, um, with your manager. And you can also share this with your skip level manager. The intention there is to ensure like continuity in case you leave the org as a manager, or it just helps with visibility when your employee is ready to get promoted. Um, it can help build support for your case if they're ready. So for filling it out, uh, you can do it line by line or section by section. And the first time you're doing this, it's going to take uh, much longer than it, you know, it takes, you know, for the next time. So I found out that it usually an hour to an hour and a half is a good amount of time. And after the first, the first time, you're really just filling out the delta from the last. So use your running list of accomplishments from all the planning docs and retros and weekly notes and, and all the other docs that Leaf mentioned. Um, fill it out separately from your manager as well so that you reduce the bias. Um, you don't want what your manager rating is to influence what you give yourself. And the next time you do it, it's just a delta. So it's you're adding new supporting work that you've done to reinforce this idea that you're meeting the expectation for this. Now for reviewing the ratings, um, you know, ideally you and your manager agree about the rating. Uh, then if you do, that's great. Uh, if you don't, then I would try to resolve it well before performance review. You don't want it to be a surprise. Uh, you know, as a manager, you don't want it to be a surprise for your direct report if they're not meeting the expectation for a certain um, criteria. So if you disagree because you think they're not doing this certain expectation well, that can be a more challenging conversation. Um, generally, the most productive thing to do is brainstorm ways that, you know, they can improve in a given category. And as an IC, if you're close, then you might really just need one more example for your manager's perception of you uh, to change. So I would, you know, sort of approach this in a very collaborative way. Uh, don't think about it like it's you versus them here. You're really trying to put together a, a promotion uh, packet for, for you. And so these are the ways that I've, uh, these are the things that I've used to, um, describe whether I'm meeting a ex expectation or not. Um, so I have exceeds, meets, is close, meets some, mildly meets, at, off track or no opportunity yet. Um, yeah. So no opportunity yet is they haven't had an opportunity to demonstrate this. So that can be a signal to your manager to, you know, identify these things for you. I like opportunities for you to show it. Um, a tip for improving the ladder. So if you find that the ladders at your company are confusing, then consider giving that feedback to the org or to your manager. Uh, ladder should be generally applicable, but sometimes an aspect or a responsibility of a team is important enough to make a compelling enough case that uh, separate ladders should be created. Security engineers often have separate ladders than straight software engineers. Um, it's a different career path than pure software engineering, and it's a specialization within it too. So it's usually considered a different ladder. Um, yeah. Now Leaf is going to talk about promotion theses. Promotion theses or promotion packets uh, are a common part of the promotion process. There's something that's either presented during calibration to the other managers, or they might be something that is presented um, to a, a smaller group after somebody's already been approved by calibration. Um, but we'll walk through what these look like. The promotion uh, thesis template that we use at SimGrip is why now? Uh, what has changed between the last cycle and this cycle that makes this person ready for promotion? Why this cycle instead of the promotion cycle next? 
what's the case for promotion? How is this person already partially performing at the next level? This is where completing a deconstructed career ladder for both the current level and the next level, as Misha mentioned earlier, can be helpful because you can use that as a way to demonstrate, like, hey, this person is already meeting some of the next level requirements. And then what's the case against promotion? Uh, what are some areas that this person's struggling in or might struggle in when they're being evaluated at the next level? After you get promoted, uh, obviously you're not going to be evaluated at your former level anymore. And so the expectations grow. And so even if you're doing well at one level, that doesn't guarantee that you're going to be meeting the next level and the organization wants you to be successful. And so if uh, if the company doesn't think you're going to be able to do that, they want to see a plan with your manager to help mitigate that. Once you've gotten your, your ducks in a row, um, or sorry, ne next we're going to talk about getting your ducks in a row for the promotion uh, thesis. So if you're close to promotion, you can ask your manager if you can uh, like help participate in this process. They might not say yes, um, but it's good to ask. And even if you can't participate in the process, you should at least be able to know what the process is. They should be able to tell you clearly what the steps are. Uh, even if you know how this process works, maybe you've already been promoted at your company a, a year or two ago, it's good to check in because this process can change as your company grows. If you're a manager, uh, try to include people proactively if possible. Um, this isn't always going to be something that you can do depending on the person and just the culture of your company. Um, but I do think that if you can do it, it's great. It's easier to do if the person is more senior. They're going to be better equipped to deal with situations where they don't get promoted, and they probably have some idea of how the promotion process works from either this company or, or a previous company that they've been at. Um, and it's good to remember not all promotions get approved. Even if you and your manager agree that you're ready for promotion, there's other steps, and uh, that doesn't mean that you or your manager did anything wrong if the promotion doesn't go through. I would use this as an opportunity to learn uh, what you need to change or, or other areas you need to grow in during the next cycle. If you're a manager, this is a really important part of pulling somebody into the promotion process. You need to tell them, like, hey, even if this doesn't go through, we're going to learn things about why other managers don't think you're ready or things that you need to do to become ready. And I've seen a lot of people that don't get promoted one cycle that end up getting promoted on the next cycle. And it's pretty common for engineering managers to remember what was discussed in previous instances and bring that up during the process. And it's, I think it's better to have a promo not go through and then go through than to not put somebody up at all and then try to put them up the next cycle because there might be things that you learned during the first failed promotion that you wouldn't have known otherwise. And now you've actually delayed things an additional six months. If you're a manager, um, I recommend writing yourself a cheat sheet for calibration. I try to have pre-written answers for some of the questions that I think I might get. This allows me to answer quickly and confidently. Unfortunately, this is more important than it should be. It should just be what people's work uh, was during that cycle, but actually being able to present it effectively is really important. Um, and so that's just kind of <laughs> the way that it is, and so it's best to, to prepare. Um, and then if you are somebody that has somebody on your team who's ready for promotion, I really recommend trying to get some uh, support from other managers that you know are going to be in calibration. Um, there's somebody on Misha's team that got promoted last cycle that I had worked with. And before calibration, Misha came to me and said, like, hey, would you be comfortable supporting these points? Like, these are the things that I really want to emphasize. And um, I said yes, because I agreed with them. And it's definitely helpful to have somebody else in your corner that can help um, push a promotion. So closing thoughts. Um, take steps to own your own career development. Nobody else is going to be with you your whole career, so you might as well get good at this stuff. Uh, it's going to help you the whole time you're working. Ask your manager how important processes work. Ask them periodically how these things work. Uh, make sure that you understand them, and more importantly, make sure that your manager understands them. If they can't tell you how performance reviews work, uh, they need to figure that out. It's a very important part of their job. If your company uses career ladders, use these to have conversations throughout the year. These shouldn't just be something that come up during calibrations and then you forget about them. 
Um, if you can have these conversations throughout the year, it's just going to make calibrations easier. It's also good to have this stuff top of mind so that you're thinking about it when you're thinking about projects and um, just other work that you're doing. Document your progress and setbacks throughout the year. This can be engineering design docs, project retros, team retros, weekly notes, a hype list. Um, all of this stuff makes uh, getting recognized for your work easier and just makes it easier to fill out like anything that you need uh, when you're looking for a new job or looking for a promo. And then make sure that you're celebrating wins for both yourself and other people. Make sure that your work is visible and that you spend time showcasing the work of people on your team. When they're doing a great job, uh, let your manager know or let that person's manager know because this is going to make a huge impact on both of your careers. Um, we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, as I mentioned, this talk is, or the, the notes for this talk are on sketch. So if there's anything you want to refer back to, um, check that out. And we will also be at the SEMGRIP booth throughout the next two days if you have questions. Uh, Lee, can I just add something? Oh, yeah, go for it. Uh, so that same, sorry, I asked your question right after. Okay. Um, so for that same scenario that Leaf just mentioned, someone on my team getting promoted. Uh, so Leaf was the interim manager on my team when I was going from Century to SEMGREP. And so when I joined, um, he had all of the peer reviews and all the manager reviews ready uh, for me to go over with him. And we went over it in a lot of detail. And when it came time to put this person up for promotion and I had to do the manager review, um, since he had a lot of context from before I joined, it was a very like collaborative process to do that together. So highly recommend, uh, I don't know, hopefully your peers are just as great as Leaf and <laughs> you're working with uh, managers like that. Yeah. So I have a question. Uh, thanks for a very inspiring presentation. Uh, and I have a question about these docs, uh, which are you using to keep the information about achievements, about impact what those achievements have. Uh, are you sharing these uh, documents with your manager? Are you keeping those publicly, publicly available within the company or are you just keeping it for yourself just to be prepared for the, uh, for, 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 for the future, for the, for the, for the discussions? Yeah, uh, so the question, yeah, yeah. yeah, so the question was um, about the written documents that you have and whether you're uh, sharing it with your manager, sharing it just to yourself or uh, publicly to the whole company. Um, I share everything with my manager, um, and as you know, I share it with them in real time. So as I'm adding things, they're able to see, um, and I let them know if something's in a draft and I'm going to like add to it later. Um, and I think there are some docs for my direct reports that I even share with my skip manager as well. So you are encouraging your individual contributors to, 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 to do it, to, to create that doc for their achievements and share with you? Yeah. yeah, 100%. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I give them a template, and then I ask them to fill out the template. And the template for their hype list and for the deconstructed career ladder, um, those are part of the same doc. They're just different sheets in, in Google Sheets. And, yeah, as Misha mentioned, that shared with me the, the report and then my manager. Those are just private to us because they are, like, personal career conversations and I want people to be able to be honest about areas they're not doing well in. For most of the other docs, like the engineering design docs and the retros, uh, both the team and the project retros, those are shared within the company. I don't really know that anybody else looks at them unless you've been tagged or like you've posted it in a channel and people are interested, but anybody can go look at those. Um, and then, uh, and then the weekly notes I just keep personally. I don't, I don't share those with anybody else. So how often are you doing this with your, your computer? This one? Yeah. Um, I do it twice a year with most of the people that report to me before the performance cycles. Um, I have kind of a lot of people reporting to me, so I, I don't have time to do it as often as I like. But I know Misha does it quarterly or even more regularly for people that are, are earlier in their career. So it just kind of depends on how senior the person is and how much time you have. Yeah, I have a, a lot more engineers that are like earlier on in their career. So I do it once a quarter. And then if someone's ready for promotion, I'll actually just check in uh, once a month. It doesn't mean we're adding a new column or anything. It just is a regular check-in of it. Yeah. 
And it is more work, but I do recommend doing, like if someone is 80% green for one level, I recommend doing it for the next level too, just to make, just to see how they compare for the expectations for the next one. So you can kind of tell if they're really ready uh, to go. Because the last thing you want is for them to get promoted and then not meet the expectations at the next level. No one, no one's going to be happy in that scenario. What is the career problem for the use that in the slides? Uh, can you repeat that? What is the career combo? Oh, the career combo. Yes, yeah, so the career combo. Hmm? I'm not familiar with the term combo. Oh, a uh, career conversation. Ah, so it's... Yeah. It, it's, yeah, I just asked my, you know, <laughs> ask my team, you know, what do they want to do? You know, do they feel like they're ready for promote it, for a promotion? Um you know, they're earlier on in their career, so I'm not really asking them five year plan. I'm more like one to one year to maybe two, two, three years. I also ask people um, to spend time ref uh, to spend time reflecting after we've gone through this and think about how the areas that they want to continue developing in align with our team's roadmap and make sure that they are letting me know the projects that they want to work on and how those are going to be related to their career ladder. I don't always have the ability to put the people on the projects that they want to work on. Um, I try to put people on the projects they want to work on because they're going to do better, <laughs> better work. But um, it is good to have them spend some independent time thinking about what they want to work on and if it is actually going to help them develop in the areas that um, they need to develop in to get to the next level. And when you're filling this out, there might be a project that, uh, you know, your direct report did well in one area during this project, but maybe, for example, like technical execution went well, but communication didn't go as well. So it's okay to kind of see one thing in multiple sections for different reasons. Um, do you like, is it only like personal, like personal one, or is it for the whole company the same right one? So these are, uh, this is just a snippet from our engineering ladders across the whole company. Um, we have like IC two, three, four, and then M one, two, three, four. Um, so this is for the whole company. Oh, but this is just for engineering within the company. Just to, yeah. Cool. cool. Well, thank you. Uh, yeah, we'll be at the SEMGRIP booth. If you have any questions, we're, we're happy to answer them. Yep. Feel free to reach out. <laughs>